if you don't want to be featured in the recording. Um, but otherwise, yes, just in, enjoy the session and um, get some questions in the chat. And, and if you if you want to raise your hand and, and discuss anything afterwards, then um, that's that's what we're here for. Um, OK, so um, I'm Annalisa Allen Norris. I am the policy and programme lead for climate change at Wandsworth Councils. Um, and I'm joined today by Jason Andrews, who leads our air quality work at Wandsworth Council and um, Joe Harrison who we're really pleased to have here today from Global Action Plan and he'll explain a bit more about um, what what they do and how they work with local um, community schools lots of other organizations um, to kind of take take action on the ground um, but if I hand over first to Jason um, and you can kick off great and I have your slides don't I Jason you do um, thanks, Annalise. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'll just give you a brief introduction. My name is Jason Andrews. Uh, I'm, my, my role is uh, to manage air quality in the Regulatory Services Partnership, and that covers three boroughs, uh, which includes Wandsworth, Merton uh, and Richmond. Um, I'm going to try the impossible today uh, and try and cover air quality in 10 or 15 minutes. I can't really do it in any real detail. Uh, because obviously I'm limited um, by the amount of time I have. But I can pick up questions outside this or refer you to some of our, our, our documents and some of our monitoring reports. Um, so thanks for that, Annalise. Um, if you can show the next slide, please. I think really the fundamental question here is, is what is pollution? Uh, and the dictionary definition of pollution is the presence or the introduction into the environment of a substance which is harmful or, or has a poisonous effect. I would argue this, that probably should be extended a little bit because you can have substances that aren't necessarily harmful or toxic, but if they're in the uh, environment in sufficient amounts, they can actually cause harm. So a perfect example of this is carbon dioxide in itself in the levels we're talking about, um, it's not going to be harmful to humans, but obviously to the planet it is a different matter. Algae plumes in water uh, is another perfect example. Algae is necessary for the for the natural environment of a, of a pond, but when it blooms or it becomes uh, in large quantity, or it occurs in large quantities, it can actually become toxic. So I think what we need to bear in mind is that pollution doesn't necessarily mean to be toxic substances but it's actually sometimes things get out of balance. Uh, pollution is naturally occurring. Um, we can see the impact of volcanoes. And I think if anybody remembers the um, volcanic eruption in uh, Iceland, we saw the fallout of that on a global scale. And we even picked up the impact of the particulates and dust in this country. Uh, another um, issue for us is, is uh, dust from Sub-Sahara, we see that dust is picked up into the atmosphere and deposited in the UK. And I think some of our largest uh, episodes have been caused by exactly that sort of sort of problem. Uh, and then we move on to um, the human made uh, pollution, which is far more complex. Uh, we've managed as a species to create substances um, and chemicals that wouldn't exist in the natural environment. Uh, and we see the effects of those, and sometimes we don't know the effects of those for, for many years. Um, pollution can be in the soil. Um, one part of my job is to, to deal with contaminated land in a borough and making sure that previous historical sites are cleaned up before planning uh, applications and new properties are being built. Uh, so I'm getting some feedback. The other side, yeah? Hello. Okay. So can I ask the microphone to switch off, please? Thank you. Um, we also have uh, pollution in um, air and water. Um, can I have the next slide, please, Annalise? Uh, I'm going to focus on specifically on air quality or air pollution, um, and there's hundreds of chemicals that create air pollution, but I'm going to focus on a few just for the purpose of this this um, presentation. Uh, the first one is nitrogen dioxide. 
Uh, nitrogen dioxide is a pollutant gas and we have legal objectives for this. I'll come on to the sources a bit later. We have carbon dioxide, which we all know is a greenhouse gas, uh, and that's linked to more or less energy consumption, uh, more or less everything we do. We also have particulates or dust, um, which is a, a very interesting uh, pollutant because it obviously exists in the natural environment and we contribute to it. And I'll cover that separately and briefly. Uh, we also have ozone. And the reason I put ozone on here is, is as we resolve some of the issues with nitrogen dioxide, we're seeing an increase in ozone. So we need to keep an eye on that particular gas. There are some other um, toxic gases as well, um, which a little bit rarer in this country. Sulfur dioxide was linked to um, acid rain. I don't know if anybody remembers back in the 70s and early 80s, there was a, a huge issue with uh, industry pumping out sulfur, which then created acid rain. I think we've more or less resolved that in this country, but I think it still exists in parts of the world. We have VOCs or volatile organic compounds. Um, these are things like uh, solvents, glues, paints, cleaning materials, uh, an interesting one for internal air quality. Um, in the natural environment, they exist, uh, and it's not really something we see generally in open spaces as a concern. It's usually in confined spaces. Carbon monoxide is a particularly nasty gas. Uh, and can be fatal in even small quantities. Can I have the next slide, please, Annalise? Um, we all think that air pollution is something new. It's not, it's been around for centuries. Um, I think the first legislation or edict from uh, King Edward I dates back to the 1300s. Uh, and this related to people burning sea coal. So sea coal was harvested on shore. I think there's a picture on the, the, at the bottom on the left. Uh, and as you can imagine, if coal has been sitting in water for a long time and then you burn it, it, it is particularly noxious. So the first legislation we saw that was an edict about burning sea coal. And then throughout the years um, or throughout the centuries, we've seen similar concerns, mostly around burning wood and coal, particularly in areas where we see population growth. So if you have a, a, a small fire in a building miles away from people, that's probably not an issue. But when you have thousands of people living together, all doing the same thing, then that's when it becomes a concern. Uh, so if we fast forward to the 1950s, uh, we saw the smogs in London killing people. This was due to the burning of coal in fire grates, particularly bad in the winter when there was a, a cold inversion holding that pollution down. Uh, and that resulted in the first Clean Air Act. Um, and then that act has been revised periodically over the past sort of 20 or 30 years. I would argue that it probably needs to be refreshed uh, to deal with some of our modern day problems, um, like the motor car and um, uh, home boilers. Uh, EU regulations drove the air quality agenda um, back in the 90s and early 2000s and imposed certain limits for certain gases. Uh, we then had Brexit and these objectives were absorbed into UK legislation. Uh, and we're obviously waiting to see how that legislation will shape over the next, the next few years. Can I have the next slide, please, Annalise? So our current, current challenge for air quality is NO2. Uh, as you can see at the bottom, there's some pictures of some of the sources. We have particulate matter, which I'll come on to, and obviously we have carbon dioxide, which is global gas. Uh, pictures at the bottom show the main sources, so traffic. Uh, each of those vehicles has a, a little um, NO2 generator on it called an engine. Uh, and as you can imagine that there are millions of these things uh, traveling around the UK roads. We also have the impact of boilers. Um, there has been a, an introduction of ultra low NOx boilers, but if you imagine that most homes in, in the UK have a boiler on it, then that contributes as well. We also have in, industry uh, and we have the rising impact of wood burning stoves. So it's sort of like history repeating itself. So if you look back to the previous slides, um, there's a, a 
these have become more and more popular and in, in in themselves in small numbers they're probably not a massive issue but because they've become so popular they're starting to show up uh, on the um, UK air quality uh, monitoring regime so we're seeing the impact of those can I have the next slide please Annalise uh, nitrogen dioxide um, this is a, a polluting gas it's an air uh, it's a health health risk gas gas um, it's purely human made, um, although it can exist in lightning strikes and in natural fires. It's caused by burning of fuels and in London, and I think most major cities, uh, most causes are from vehicles. And this is um, obviously uh, fuel vehicles, these petrol or combustion engines, should we say. And we also have the um, heating and domestic, uh, sorry, domestic heating and commercial heating. Um, just out of interest, when we saw during the lockdown the lack of vehicles on the road, we saw that it didn't reduce NO2 completely. Um, what happened is that we had this background level in London, which usually sits at about 20 micrograms. So even though we had no vehicles on the road at some point, we still saw these underlying levels of um, nitrogen dioxide. Uh, nitrogen dioxide causes respiratory illness. There's a huge amount of, uh, of evidence and research that goes into that. Uh, and it particularly affects people that have uh, underlying health problems. Uh, can I have the next slide, please, Annalise? Particulates, this is a really interesting one because particulates exist everywhere. I think, as we said, that uh, some of this is blown up from deserts or produced into the atmosphere from, from normal events wind picking up soil dust and that sort of thing. But there's also a human made contribution. So where you have the natural components to particulates, you also have some of the things that we've introduced into that around black carbons. And, and I think the research is now moving towards some of these plastics that are in the air. Um, it's measured in sizes. So we have PM 10s and PM 2.5, but you can get PMs in, in um, lots of different sizes from 50 down to uh, sub PM1. So if you look here, there's a picture of um, human hair. You can fit 10, uh, 5 PM molecules in molecules, dust particulates across the width of the hair. And PM 2.5 is basically a quarter of that. The health issues caused by these, the smaller the particle, the deeper into the body it gets. It causes respiratory illness. And these really small particles are now showing up in human tissue and in human bloodstream. So they are, and the research is now moving towards um, linking these things to Alzheimer's and heart disease. Um, and it's quite, it's quite bad, some of the, 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 the medical um, uh, research that's coming out on that. Can I have a next slide, please, Annalise? I'm sort of realising that I'm painting a really horrible picture of, of pollution here, and I think it's probably a, a good time to say that there's a lot of good work going on. Um, we don't want to be complacent. Uh, we know that we still have a problem in London. But when you consider globally, London doesn't even appear in the top 500 polluted cities, and we're way down the list in the EU. We do actually do a fairly good job at tackling this, but we can't be complacent and there's still a lot of work to do. In addition to that, we've also seen the, um, the guidance levels from the World Health Organization um, reduce significantly, which is going to be an, e an even bigger challenge for us. But we need to see how, how that sort of embeds itself into UK legislation. So there's lots of people responsible for air quality. We have central government, uh, responsible for legislation, regulation, taxation, um, emission standards. Uh, we have regional government. Uh, in our case, that would be the GLA, and they're responsible for buses, red routes, uh, regulation of taxes, uh, coordinating air quality action. And then we have local government, which is us, uh, and we are responsible for monitoring, um, planning, local transportation, cycling initiatives, greening of the borough, all of those things that go to make um, the borough uh, a nice place. Um, so really in short, all of these three groups need to be pulling in the, the same direction to resolve the problem of air quality. And as I say, we are 
doing an awful lot of good work uh, and we have made great inroads into tackling um, pollution but there's still a lot to do and I think one of the important things and I think we tend to miss this is that we're all responsible so everything we do from the way we heat our homes to the way we travel to our deliveries that we get at home all contribute so I don't really like to see that disconnection between what the government should be doing what people should be doing because they are to me one of the same can I have the next slide please Annalise just a quick outline of um, air quality in Wandsworth um, we've seen improvements uh, over the past five to ten years um, still not enough uh, there's still areas of the borough that exceed and I think we still need to carry on monitoring even in those areas that um, don't exceed uh, there's a map here that show um, the green dots show that these are areas that we're monitoring um, and the red dots are ones where we monitor and they're not compliant um, every year we produce what's called an annual status report which is a detailed report of air quality in the borough and, and that covers some of that granular data still lots of improvements to be made and I think there's still lots, lots of improvements we need to, to make around monitoring of air pollution in the borough. Can I have the next slide, please? Uh, that brings me on nicely to um, the borough's new air quality action plan. Uh, this is now out for consultation. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to be a, I want it to be a meaningful consultation. I want people to contribute to it. So I would ask you to uh, join the consultation, um, put forward some positive ideas. Um, be honest about how you feel around air quality um, i'm happy to meet with people outside this meeting uh, and there will be um, a feedback as part of the consultation so uh, i'll send a link over at some point to all the people at the meeting but i would say join the con consultation please so i'll hand over now to joe who probably be more um, based around the practical stuff and perhaps not so doom and gloom as i am thanks joe thanks jason Hi everybody, um, thanks all for coming and thanks for inviting me uh, Wandsworth too. I will just share my screen, give me a moment. Uh, right. Oh, sorry about this. OK, hopefully you can all see that. Uh, sorry, let me just get my ducks in a row here. Um, right. Um, yeah, so I am Joe. I work for Global Action Plan um, and it's great to be here to kind of in, be involved in this conversation and tell you a little bit more about how you can take action on air pollution. Um, to give you a bit of insight into who we are, who Global Action Plan are. You might have heard of us, um, but if you haven't, we're a environmental charity. Um, the people behind Clean Air Day, um, which some of you might be familiar with. So that's uh, been going for the last four or five years. Um, it's usually in June and it's kind of a big time for the whole clean air movement to come together um, around what people are doing to take action on air quality. Um, and we're all about um, uh, working for a green and thriving planet and lots around people and well-being and bringing that all together. Um, and I actually want to pause here a moment. Um, I know you've heard a lot from Jason about the problem, um, but I do want to hear a bit from you um, around why improving air quality is important, why you're here, why you wanted to attend this session today. Um, uh, so we've got a link on Slido, which I will put in the chat now, actually, um, which you can all then contribute to and we can get some ideas together around. Um, yeah, what, what, why improving air quality is important to you, why, um, why you're here today. So just bear with me a moment. Um, I will put that in the chat. Uh, so you should be able to just click on that link there that I put in the chat um, and join and then contribute um, to that question and I will share my screen and we'll get some answers in there so it'd be really interesting to hear from you around you know why improving air quality is important to you what why you're here today um, 
if you don't mind contributing, that would be wonderful. Um, hopefully that's working for people. Uh, Joe, I can't click, it won't do anything when I click on it. Has, is oh. there an extra full stop in the Slido? Oh, that's strange. Um, no, I think that is correct. Ah, okay. It's working well, that's for me, Joe. It's oh, is it? Okay. Um, so if you also just go to slido.com and then put in 415527, I will put this in the chat again. Oh. Um, yeah, is the code. Um, I was just trying to make it easier, but that's frustrating that it's not worked. Um, oh, great. So we've got some things coming in here now. Um, let me just share this and then everyone can see um, what people are contributing. Um, so you can see we've got things coming in around why improving air quality is important, so improving health. Um, improving health, getting lots of, well, as they get bigger, you can see more people have voted for them there. Um, healthy lungs, bluer skies, um, great stuff. Um, I definitely resonate with that. And I think, yeah, as Jason said, I think we all kind of saw that a bit during COVID, didn't we? That um, with lockdowns and things, some of the, sc the skies did become clearer, there were less cars on the road, um, these sorts of things. Um, so thank you for sharing there. Sorry if it didn't work. Um, we will come back to that again um, a bit later. Um, I'll just knit back to my slides. Um, but I think that's useful to get thinking about. Um, yeah, why it's important, why you're here today um, as we then go on to talk about what we can do, how, how, what actions we can take. Um, um, so keep thinking on that um, and we can always discuss it further at the end. So what can we do about air, air pollution? And I think it was interesting, Jason, talking about that responsibility um, and the fact that I would kind of agree that we all do have responsibility. And whilst we can government, local government definitely have a role, I think as individuals, we can also um, look to act on that. Um, and I wanted to share this, which is a periodic table of um, action that you can take on air pollution that one of my colleagues pulled together. Um, there's a lot there. I don't expect you to read it all right now. Um, but as, as we said at the start, this is all being recorded and you can access the slides after um, two. But I think what this just highlights is the scale of different actions that you can take. There's lots here um, and you can see the colour coding on the side that um, kind of links it to different groups or different audiences there as well. Um, so wherever you might be, whatever kind of groups or networks you might be in or however you um are kind of tuned in with the community um i like to think that there is actions that everyone can take um, um so i'll just give a give a, another moment to have a bit more of a look over that um and you can kind of see yeah the scale of that and that everyone can play a role in taking action uh i then wanted to split it by indoor and outdoor um so i suppose indoor air pollution might be something that we don't think about as much um, but can also be yeah very high and something that we probably should take I suppose the main courses are cooking or um, cleaning products um, and things like that so there's simple actions that we can all take that you can see on the slide here around um, improving indoor air, air quality uh, so that's things like ventilation opening windows um, but not when they're onto a busy road though I suppose it's that balance as well um, and then there's like low chemical cleaning products and VOCs that you might have heard of, volatile organic compounds. Um, so if you can find products which have low VOCs, then they're better in terms of air pollution too. Um, and then there's stuff around wood burning stoves as well, which Jason mentioned, um, and open fires and barbecues. So again, simple, simple little changes that we can all make um, thinking about indoor air pollution. Uh, and then outdoor, and again, I think we might, People might be quite familiar with some of this stuff, um, but it is stuff around transport. We know transport is the biggest cause of air pollution um, in London. Um, so thinking about journeys, thinking about how you get from A to B, um, can you take public transport or walk or cycle? 
can you take quieter routes um, and that's where some of the monitoring that Jason talked about is quite can be quite useful um, and there's a lot more going on in London around that too um, so thinking about where the air, air pollution hotspots are um, and then maybe taking a quieter route so that you're not exposed to that um, idling that you might be familiar with so that's uh, when you're stopped in your car um, and you leave the engine on um, and then that creates a lot of air pollution quite unnecessarily. Um, so trying to remember to turn off your engine when the car isn't moving. And then deliveries, and this is one that I'm really personally trying to think about a lot more. Um, trying to think about uh, buying things in bulk if you need to get stuff delivered, can you click and collect or can you go and get stuff? Um, and green delivery slots, whether they're a thing or cargo bikes for the last mile delivery and those sorts of things, which are starting to pop up a, pop up a lot more, just so we try and reduce the number of vehicles moving about on the streets and creating air pollution. Um, so that's a little split by indoor and outdoor. I then want to also share some of the resources that uh, Global Action Plan have that can help you um, take action. Um, going back, thinking back to that periodic table of all those different actions and the different audiences. Um, so I want to start with schools. Um, and this is actually the program that I work on for GAP. Um, which is the London Schools Pollution Help Desk. Um, so if anyone's in a school community or has has children, or um, uh, then this is something that can support schools in taking action. So we can provide this one-on-one -on -one support um, to schools. We can help them with clean up action plans, or we can go in and run educational sessions um, in the schools. Um, and it's all free for schools to access. So um, worth checking out if that's something that um, you yeah you know that you have you have connections with schools at all um and similarly we have the clean air for schools framework which is a tool like a self audit tool almost online um for uh for schools to create a clean air action plan um so it's an easy way of them there's all these actions that they can take but then they can kind of streamline it down to a set of prioritized actions um which uh, means that they can then it's easier and they kind of can feel more empowered and more able to take those actions. So that's that's quite an easy little tool that's online. Um, and again, I can share share afterwards um, there. Uh, so that's schools. If you know anyone in schools or um, then there, there are easy ways, we, ways to take action and we can support them with that. Um, businesses, so GAP Global Action Plan also work with businesses. So if you're involved in businesses who want to take action on air quality, um, or you want to drive businesses to do more on the, these issues, um, then we have a kind of couple of initiatives and particularly I want to talk about business for clean air, which is a set of principles that businesses can sign up to to say they're committed to taking action. And then it's kind of stuff around that in terms of the actions that they take and moving on from that. So that's, again, quite an easy way of cementing that commitment from business to do more on these issues. Um, uh, and then Finally, I want to talk about, or well, not finally, I've got one more after this, but health professionals as well. So um, one thing that's come out of recent uh, reports is around health professionals needing more training and needing to be more aware of the effects of health, air pollution. So some of the stuff that Jason talked about and then being able to advise accordingly to patients. Um, so we've got some resources to help with that. So we're starting to build up um, a bank of training videos and things like that, um, which can help health professionals to talk to patients about air pollution. Um, there's also the clean air hospital framework, um, which again is a way of hospitals creating an action plan um, to again, think about the different actions that they can take um, to tackle air, quality, air pollution. Um, so again, something to think about if you are involved in, um, in uh, the NHS at all. And then finally, I want to go back to communities um, and how we as a community or how you and Wandsworth as communities, if you're in different groups or different um, networks taking action, I suppose um, I think it is about understanding the problem. So uh, some of the stuff that Jason talked about in terms of the scale of the problem, the health impacts um, and what it actually means for a community, what else it actually means, particularly for vulnerable people's health um, uh, when the air pollution is high. And then there's those personal actions you can take. And I personally um, think that they're really important for 
um, kind of understanding how we can all take action and setting those examples. Um, but then it is also about talking to others, isn't it? And raising that awareness um, as a community and whether you can, whether we can then organize um, into groups that can then advocate for more change, whether that's with um, local government or national government or um, yeah, MPs and those sorts of things. Um, so I think that's mostly me. Um, we've got one more Slido slide, which hopefully I saw some stuff in the chat. Um, hopefully that's easier to access now. Um, so again, I kind of before we break into a discussion, I just wanted everyone to spend a few moments reflecting on what actions you could take, um, what actions you might already be taking, any examples that you have there. Um, just um, to reflect on what we've what we've shared and um, yeah, any any actions that you think you could go on to take or that you're already taking, um, I think it'd be really interesting to hear that. Um, thank you. And then we yeah, we can have more discussion. So hopefully you can access the Slido either via one of the links if that was working or slido.com and then you put 415527 in and that should work in the join participants bit at the top. Um, so let me just get that up again. Bear with me a second. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, I can see that um, I've just joined that that poll. Oh, good. So I can, it's I can see it. Yeah, I can see it's yeah. working for me, um, and I can see that there's a few other people who've joined it as well. I put the um, th just the link to just it's slido.com for for anyone who yeah. hasn't used yeah, it before. Yeah, great. Um, and then the codes in the chat as well. So um, I know I think Judith was having problems getting, but hopefully it's there. Oh yeah, I can see some. Here we go. Yeah, so those more has come in on that first one now, which is great. Sorry, maybe we didn't spend long enough on that, but that's good to see. So yeah, in terms of improving air quality and why it's important, so about cut off fumes, children's health, um, active travel, the future world. I think that's, yeah, I suppose thinking about this being uh, uh, together on climate change and the links to climate um, was probably something that, yeah, we could have highlighted more just then in terms of lots of these issues are about, as Jason said, like fossil fuels and transport. Um, so when we make changes on air quality, it can also improve the climate. And then if we go to the next one. Um, sorry, you maybe didn't have didn't have opportunity to fill that in until I went on to it there. Um, so yeah, do, if anyone has any thoughts about yeah what actions you think you could take um, or you're already taking or um, and then we can we can always discuss this more as well if people have got questions. Um, Sorry, I I can't. I I've tried five times to get onto that Slido thing, and I just uh, wanted to talk a little bit about citizen science projects and things. Um, there are things that Breathe London do eventually after yeah. the. Um, shortage of chips is solved. They they have monitors that yes. community groups can apply to obtain. And certainly my group in Putney is very keen to get on with this kind of thing because we have a long history of citizen science projects on right. mm. um, air pollution going back to 2011. Um, and, and they really are quite important because, you know, you can, I mean, Jason has got all these monitoring places, which are terrific, but you can find other ways of doing it. I mean, for example, if we've been able to get a monitor in time, we wanted to measure the impact of the ULES on traffic on roads immediately outside yeah. the ULES and, and stuff like that. And there are always projects like that that you can um, that you can get involved in locally and Jason and his team I know are very keen to involve community groups and things like that I mean we have quite a lot of experience of doing it but any new group can get advice from Jason and David and Maya and, and people like that to, to make sure that they set up something that has some sort of basis in reality I mean you can yeah. measure things and it doesn't say much sometimes you've got to do it in a in a careful kind of way yeah, I yeah. think can, I'll, I'll just add to that. I think local residents know what's going on in their areas. They know the local problems. Um, we have finite resources. If we can get people engaged in this sort of thing, it helps us get a picture of what's happening in the borough and local issues. So we're more than happy to support that. We're more than happy to provide 
uh, resourcing, um, staff time, diffusion tubes, handheld monitors. Uh, so, and, but it also, it's not just about that, it's about getting people engaged and aware of what's happening in the local area. So yeah, absolutely support that. In terms of monitoring, we put in the air quality action plan that we need to be ramping up some of this monitoring, especially around the PM 2.5s. There's a couple of things happening at the moment in Putney High Street and my colleagues in transport have installed monitoring devices there. We've got the rollout of Breathe London monitors, so if there are locations and people want to come back to me, happy to do that. And I think we also need to have some automated, calibrated PM 2.5 monitoring of the borough. It's in the uh, the draft plan, so mm. happy to, to listen to comments. Yeah, no, I'd yeah. agree there and agree with Judith. I think, yeah, really good point in terms of understanding the problem and knowing as a local community where, where the monitors can be and then being able to take action when you kind of have that data to support things. Sorry, I know we've got lots of hands up. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we've got loads of hands up in the chat and there's also a few comments. I mean, Judith, I know you've picked up on, on the comment that you made in the chat and that and one of the one of the, the one things I wanted to touch on, actually, before we um, delve into many people who've got their hands up um, is, is part of what Judith was talking about with all these different types of monitoring. I know there's there's cheaper monitoring, there's really expensive monitoring that obviously that we pay for as a borough that's paid for um, by large organisations on the small community groups. So there are multiple different ways ways of assessing how um, air pollution is changing over time. Um, do you this kind of specifically reference the ultra low emission zone? And I just wondered whether it was worth briefly touching on that because obviously that impacts um, ones with residents. Um, so I know that's obviously at the forefront of our minds. Um, Jason in particular, if, if you want to give us a really quick summary of actually what that is and what, what it means for the people who are on this call and, and other people in the borough. Yeah. Um there's been some really encouraging data coming from the GLA about the impact of the inner London zone. And if that can be replicated outside, I think there's going to be a beneficial thing. I think London boroughs would like to have seen it extended to the M25. Um, and I think over time that may happen. Uh, we have the unique situation in the borough where we're bisected. And I think um, one of my other boroughs as well is, is also cut in half. Um, which does cause really hyperlocal issues, uh, particularly around using things like amenity centres. Um, but there is monitoring in place. We have we, we rolled out our monitoring um, about two years ago. We extended it to capture probably a better picture of the borough because it was slightly lacking in places. So we should have a good footprint but locally. I think colleagues in um, the highways team are doing an awful lot of monitoring with these real time monitors in Putney High Street. So I'm really intrigued to see what's going to come back on that. Myself, I think the, the the direction of pollution is that I think most this is outside the changes to the World Health Organization, because if they're implemented, then it pushes more or less the whole of London into non-compliance. But if we have the targets that we have at the moment, we were seeing a lot of our red areas turning green. And I think over time we would have focused down on those town centres to try and get a better picture of the sources there. So that's a really long answer to a very simple question. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, we, we are aware um, in theory, the data we saw coming back from the GLA is really positive in terms of emissions, even on the boundaries. Uh, but we need to see what the effect is in our borough and there is monitoring being rolled out. Yeah, yeah and it's, it's extending to the um the south circular essentially isn't it so um so whilst whilst it doesn't apply on the south circular itself everything inside of the south inside, circular is, yeah. is where the ultra low emission zone is it applies from a few weeks ago um so that just means that if you're entering that zone um, and you have a car or another vehicle that's non-compliant um that means you essentially have to pay a fee um so and you can find out whether or not you have a compliant vehicle by going onto TFL's website. And essentially, if you have a car that's uh, a Euro six diesel or a Euro four petrol, you're fine. But anything less than that. So that's actually some relatively new diesels. Yeah. And we know that diesels are um, one of the primary sources of, of the air pollution in our area. What I would say that there are schemes that apply to the whole of London. So we have the low emission zone for freight and commercial yeah. vehicles. Um, we at the RSP are running a, 
uh, alt uh, a clearly construction zone for London. So we're out auditing all the construction sites in London to make sure they don't have dirty vehicles on there. I'm quite happy to talk about that project. Uh, I'm blue in the face because it's a brilliant piece of work that my team's been delivering. But it's just just go show you that we are tackling these things more widely. But the ULES, yeah, unfortunately, it's in a it's in a quite small location. But I think over time it will probably extend. Um, so I wonder whether we pick up some. I think um, Angie was probably the first to have a hand up, um, and then Debbie. Um, we've got a few people with their hands up in the chat. I'm just going through in the order that I saw them pop up. So Angie, I don't know whether you've got a question still. Hi everyone. Yeah, thanks for the presentation so far. Very interesting. Um, I work in Wandsworth and I actually live in the borough of Greenwich and work from home. So um, obviously air pollution in the whole of London affects me as it does everyone in this meeting. And I was really interested to know whether the speakers today uh, or their organisations as well, whether they um, support the Silvertown Tunnel, which is being built at Greenwich Peninsula. It's um, a two billion plus tunnel under the river, uh, joining the existing road that leads to the Blackwall Tunnel, which is a Victorian tunnel uh, crossing the river at Greenwich. And um, this new tunnel is going to be built so that HGVs and obviously double-decker buses can go through and cars. And I'm personally against this. And I just wondered what the position was of the speakers of the Silvertown Tunnel project. Shall I jump in on this one? I mean, it's difficult for me as an officer of the council to answer that because I don't necessarily represent the authority. Um, I also, to be honest with you, I don't really know because I'm not local to that area. I know most of the problems that are going on in my boroughs. Um, but I couldn't really answer with any degree of accuracy. I don't know if I could do as a council officer in a public meeting. It's a difficult one. But I understand that there are concerns um, floating about. Um, and I know that our cleaner construction for London team are auditing some of the construction work over there. But beyond that, it's, it's really difficult for me to say. Yeah, sorry, Angie. Yeah, I think I'm going to give quite a similar answer. I think. Um... On a personal level, um, if I can take my organisational hat off, then I'm, yeah, in a similar mind to you. But I think um, it is, yeah, it's more complicated um, perhaps than than I know, and I would need to look into it a bit more um, to give a fuller answer there. Yeah, I do appreciate that. So I do would be would encourage everyone to take a look and find out what they think about the tunnel because there is still time to change the way that we um, move traffic across the river, uh, especially down uh, down Greenwich Way where there's not a lot of crossings, but also to sort of think about more active travel and and think about the health and the economic um, area. So yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great question, Angie. I think it's it, it picks up on loads of the points that we try and look like look at as, as a whole as officers and people who are working in in this area because it's not it's just it's not one thing that that causes air pollution. Um, and some of the points you picked up, you know, heavy duty vehicles and things, big lorries, um, providing more infrastructure for that actually we also we we need to be looking at how we change infrastructure that we have and how we shift people to other modes of transport and i think a lot of the work that that we do obviously as council but also that gap do and other organizations do is is trying to make that mo mobility shift um and some of the things you know heavy duty vehicles so lorries and things i think joe picked it up in his presentation um what could we do to look at like last mile delivery so how do we get those lorries off our roads that are close to um, lots of human beings so reduce reduce the exposure of those particular individuals to, to high levels of air pollution um, and, and some of the stuff that that we're doing is working with local businesses um, and uh, getting them to use e-cargo bikes um, and helping other people in the borough um, to use cargo bikes for their individual shopping. Um, there will be a cargo bike on Saturday actually at um, Battersea Arts Centre so if you want to come and have a look that's great um, and there's somebody from Pedal My Wheels there who um, can can get you involved in trying a bike before you buy one and things so that's it that's a way of trying to kind of transition away from using those those big lorries um, and generating those huge emissions from from individual vehicles. Um, 
I don't know whether you've got another point on that, Joe, or whether we should um, move on to another question. I think we had Debbie was next. Yeah, no, I think you've covered that really nicely, Annalise. Thank you. Go ahead, Debbie. Um, OK, thank you. And, um, you know, I welcome everything that Wandsworth is doing uh, for, for climate change and the environment. I think it's so important. Um, I wondered, so my concern is particularly health because I work in the health sector, but I think health is one of the biggest areas. And the UK limits on uh, small particles like PM 2.5s and PM 10s are a sort of half or two and a half times our limits are two, two and a half times higher than the WHO limits for the small, smallest particle. And the PM 2.5s I've got cause five, they can, you can attribute 5% of deaths to PM 2.5s. So th these are really important pollutions to keep an eye on and I wanted to get a feel from you about where you see within Wandsworth the you know are there particular areas which are worse than it's so particular particulates or, or other pollutants that are way higher you know where are we bad performers across Wandsworth and what are the sources of those so I'm just I know of course we all have to do our bit um, and I don't have a feel for how much industry there is in Wandsworth um, creating pollution, but I just wondered where where we perform worst, particularly on the health related ones. Shall I jump in on that one, Annalise? Um, you're absolutely right. I think the general um, belief is that there is no safe limit for particulates, even if there are guideline levels. Um, the World Health Organization dropped their guideline levels in September uh, and they are way below um, the UK objective levels. So I think that there is going to be some change that happens. Uh, in terms of PM 2.5s and PM 10s, um, like many boroughs, we don't have that detailed data in the borough. Uh, we have either diffusion tubes that monitor NO2 or we have automated stations that basically sit in I think we've got seven in, in the borough. So to actually get that detailed granular information is where these low cost real time monitors will come in and that will give us an understanding of um, particulates in certain parts of the borough. Um, unfortunately, what it won't do and, and one of the biggest issues around particulate monitoring is it doesn't tell you what type of particulates they are. So some particulates are much worse than others. So that whole speciation of, of the types of particulates um, is going to be a question that's being asked. We also, there's discussion at the moment around microplastics in the air. So they will form part of particulates. And we also got nanoparticulates, which are the really small particulates that get probably into people's DNA. So the, the research is moving quite dramatically towards particulates. In the borough, I would say, if we look at the history of, of some of the, the issues that we've had, construction is one of the, the areas of concern for particulates because they're doing cutting and they create dusty activities. Um, and that's one thing we can tackle and challenge. We did so in, in Nine Elms really successfully. Uh, but the simple answer is we need that data to try and understand what's happening at the borough at a really local level. And I'm thinking that it is going to be either very local, so construction industries, dirty roads, particular areas um, that are associated with industry, or it will be wider things like these um, episodes are blown in from agriculture and outside. And it might just be a mixture of all of that. Yeah, I think that's really awesome. Thank you. Is is there anything we can do to help you get that data? Uh, first of all, I would say please feedback on the air quality action plan specifically around monitoring um, and talk about these these local issues and your concerns and put them forward because obviously um, the the conversations that come out of that will then influence what actions we can take and, and, and what resources we can put into those areas. Um, there is a brief London network which is a network of monitors that are specifically there for picking up PM 2.5s um, and that's something that you could do um, and it might be something that I could help fund with, might be. Um, so uh, and then it's, so yeah I think putting the pressure on understanding local problems 
Uh, you're seeing what's going on at a local level. So if you've got a really hor horrendous construction site that's spewing out dust and things like that, then obviously let us know. Well, we do have a, a team that, that deal with construction sites. Um, but I think we just genuinely need to understand these pollutants at a granular level and see what's going on at parts of the borough. Uh, and that will enable you to have policy that challenges it or tackles it. Super, thanks, Jason. Um, I think the next person was Graham. And great question, by the way, Debbie. It's, it's something that we wrangle with on a daily basis. Um, uh, I think Graham was um, next and, and then Shaz after that, I think. Hi, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, my name's Graham Peterson. I live in Tooting um, and I'm a member of the Greener Jobs Alliance. Uh, Joe, you, you may or may not know that uh, we do have a, a project going on with um, Global Action Plan um, based in Tooting at the moment, Tooting and Ballam, and we've got part ownership with you of uh, PM 2.5 uh, monitor. Um, I just wanted to, well, I suppose, pick up on Debbie's point in terms of where the hotspots are. Um, we certainly feel that Tooting is one of these. Um, we've been doing monitoring since 2013, off and on uh, in the area. And most recently in September, where we had took the PM 2.5 monitor <coughs> and went around um, various workplaces as well as external areas and found some incredibly high levels, um, up to 164 micrograms per cubic metre. Uh, so we felt there was a real need to follow this up. So we have actually booked in with GAP um, the use of the monitor for a two week period in December, where we hope to do um, further monitoring. Because of course, tooting isn't part of the extended view there. It's outside the area. Um, and we think tooting and Ballum um, are both areas which really warrant um, further monitoring. And if anyone does on this call want to get involved, then um, please get in touch. But um, we'll, we'll be discussing it at the Wandsworth Environment Forum uh, that's coming up, as, as well as in, uh, in other locations. Um, can I just add to that, Annalise? Um, we do have equipment that we are happy to loan as part of citizen science projects, and that does include PM monitors. Uh, and we've actually got some very good calibrated kit that's that's quite mobile. So bear that in mind, Graham. Um, what I would say is that we had some really strange experiences with with particulates. We we do what's called scores audits. So we go around and we measure air quality in schools and, and we measure the air quality around the schools. And we had a really strange case where inside the school we had horrendously high levels of particulates, but outside the school it was actually fine. Uh, and that was traced down to um, an air conditioning system that hadn't been cleaned for probably, ooh, oh, it must have been five or ten years. Uh, and you know, it was a really simple um, solution to it, um, but it just shows you that you can have these really strange episodes that you pick up. Um, but unless you know what's going on in that particular area, you can't tackle it. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a highlighting some personal experience of the difficulties of that one. Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky beast, isn't it? And, and, you know, air pollution changes so so quickly between different times of the day and also different locations. And that's why some of these kind of citizen science groups and, and Graham, what you were talking about before, about this, you know, the hyperlocal monitoring work that's going on um, with lots of different types of monitoring is, is so important in trying to identify what our biggest source of pollution are um, and exactly, you know, who's responsible for that and, and how we get to the bottom of it. Um, great. I think we've probably got time for one more question. I know Shaz has still got her hands up. Um, so uh, yeah, make it make it a good one, Shaz. Hi there. Um, yeah, my name is Shaz. This is really a question for Jason. So um, when the pandemic started, there were a lot of changes made to the A24. Um, I don't know if you know it, but uh, um, all the left turnings from Tooting were um, not allowed anymore and Ramsden Road became the only left turning and as a result of that we have an obscene amount of excess uh, speed, air pollution, traffic 
Um, and I was really wondering what can be done about that? Because, I mean, there's got to be a high level of toxic air pollution now as a result of these changes. Um, haven't had any luck with anybody about it, even though we've done petitions and things like that. So um, I'd be very interested if, Jason, if we could pursue this after, um, outside, if you can send me your email, and maybe we can do something about monitoring it because it really is um, really quite bad. So I, I appreciate your comments. Yeah, it, it may be that we've already monitored on that particular scheme and there may be some reporting in the background. I assume this is the low um, traffic neighbourhoods where um, we try to prevent cut throughs. Um, I think in general, the the idea of them um, is absolutely right because we're trying to get traffic away from people or try and make the flows better. But I think in some cases it has actually put pressure on the main roads, which is by accident increased pollution. So I think every site is going to be different. Um, I can't answer this site off the top of my head, but I probably have a member of the team. I'm who not can. talking about the main road. Well, it's, it's not actually the main road, it's the residential road that I'm more concerned about because all yeah. the no left turns on the high road have gone down to um, Bal Ramsden Road, which is where the Waitrose is. And there was already um, a lot of traffic there. So we were one of the six roads who trialled the 20 miles an hour when it first came out about 10 years ago. Um, and that was it was all going well. And then this new introduction happened and it's literally gone back 10 years. And I was just really wondering if yeah. we could have it monitored again. It, we definitely would like something to happen because we need to show that the way the current levels are, we, we have a councillor, an, an ex councillor that used to live, um, who used to be, who lives on Ramsden Road. Um, and she's fully aware of the situation but because she's no longer council there isn't very much you can do about it um i, I, I would simply say it, it may be that we it, have I think that it needs, i would be grateful somebody would look at it um and if not we do have a citizen science scheme which i think judith talked about earlier that we actually can help people monitor if they need to monitor themselves so there will be a, a yes to either one okay great thank, thank you, you. Um, that was that was quite a quite a difficult note to end on. I think it really highlights um, one of the things that I've noticed, which is uh, many people seem to be driving more generally. And certainly, a lot of the statistics show that there is more traffic on the streets um, at this point in time than there has been on average. Um, and and that is really driving up um, congestion, and that's obviously contributing to air pollution. And so there's lots of you know, there's there's government regulations. Um, uh, you know, in, in how how does government transition us to cleaner vehicles? How do we locally on the ground um, change the infrastructure and change our street layouts to improve things? How do we make better choices ourselves as individuals um, to to use something other than a car, for example? Um, and there's a lot of so there's lots of things that can be done at every level. Um, and I know we're sort of all trying to tackle that together. Um, I think we've actually gone over time now, so I will bring this um, bring this event to a close. Um, but thank you so much to Joe from Global Action Plan um, for his insight um, and all the work that you guys do. It's it's fantastic, and there's loads of resources out there that everybody can tap into. Um, and Jason, thanks very much for giving us that rundown of, of air pollution and how it's changed over time, and and the things that we're doing at the council. Um, and do please contribute to um, the consultation on the air quality action plan because this is the opportunity to to actually really make make changes in in what we're doing um, I'll put a link in the chat um, to our together on climate change festival events because we're going to pick up more of this um, in uh, in, in our event on Saturday and um, we've got a main stage event um, with some speakers we've got activities there is going to be a cargo bike there for people who want to see that and how we're working with businesses uh, we've got events that are happening through the rest of the week there's an electric vehicles webinar this evening um, and we've had other sort of transport related events earlier in the week which are also being recorded um, so thank you everyone for coming and having such a stimulating conversation um, thank you Jason thank you Joe um, Joe, if you want to pop your links in the chat to, to Global Action Plan as well, that would be fantastic. Um, and this will be posted on our website so everyone can come back and have a look and, uh, you know, contribute further. OK, thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. Have a great day.
பாக்கலாம்